I never understood one thing. <clears throat> For years, I had a question and I never had an answer. What was my question? The Torah says that the Yetzirah and the Yetzirah are equal and balanced. <clears throat> your Yetzirah is as strong as your Yetzirah. One is not stronger than the other or else you have no free will really. You're forced to do either one. But in order to give you free will, they have to be balanced and equal in pressure. We'll call that the, the, the impulse pressure. The impulse pressure of the Yetzirah <clears throat> has to be equal to the impulse pressure of the Yetzirah. Okay? So therefore, in any particular generation, <clears throat> what would you expect if these two are equally balanced? There would be an equal balance of Sadiqim and Rishon. Right. Is that true? No, there's way more Rishon. Right. Why? Not only way more, way, way more. Like in the Dora Mabo. Yeah. I mean, but it's, it's almost like the Yetzirah ruled. It's the only impulse that a person feels is the Yetzirah. Because God destroyed the whole world. In the Doha Flog also, everyone participated in building the Tower of, of Bovel. Not a lot, in every generation. People are constantly doing way more sins than not, you know what I mean? Like even in the door of Mitzrayim, right? The door of Mitzrayim. What? All the Jews worship the Egyptian idols. That's why God punished them. That's why the Korban Pesach is a, is a kapor for them. If God didn't bring the Korban Pesach, God would have had to destroy all the Jews, you know where? By Yamsuf. Because what happened by Yamsuf? Said so the Jews were also worshiping idols. No, no, but but the the, the Jews already brought the Korban Pesach in Mitzrayim, and they were they repented it. But when they got to the Yamsuf, they redid the chait. Why? Because they said to Moshe Rabbeinu, when they saw the sea in front of them and the Egyptians in the back of them. So we should have gone back to Egypt and died there. But what they really meant, we should have gone back to Egypt and re retaken our experience in Egypt. We were better off there, better off even though we worshipped idols. That was really what they were saying. What do we need this? That's why God was so mad at them. And immediately... Yamsuf became the place of tremendous Kitrug because the Sultan said, well, what is going on here? Look at them. They've gone back to Egypt. Back to Egypt means this lifestyle they had in Egypt. So the Yetzirah so said to God, the Sultan, who's the Malach of Dardin, he said, is this is the people you want to give the Torah to? Is this the people you want to give all the Mabba to? Is this some kind of a joke? They just got out of Egypt. And they saw what? They saw 10 Marcus, right? Spectacular. I mean, if anyone who witnessed those 10 Marcus would be shocked. God literally subverted nature in front of the Jews to show the Jews his reality, his existence. And so, so the sun says, that, what is this? Suddenly they see the Egyptians back there and they see the sea in front of them. That means that suddenly they all have chavota. They want to go back to Egypt. But of course they wanted to go back to Egypt because they wanted to survive. Because they thought the Egyptians wanted to kill them all, which may have been an, uh, some motive, I don't know. But the, yes, the sun said to God, but they don't trust you yet. Even though you've indicated to them that you are the creator of the universe, so the the so what they don't realize really what's motivating the Egyptians to collect and suddenly want to destroy them or take over. Where, where is this coming from? 
are the Egyptians doing this? Yeah, this is God. God is the only one who does anything. No one can do anything. Because all you are is self-awareness. So therefore, maybe God is doing this to test your resolve, to test your betochen. And why should he do that? Because he can rely on the ten makas, on the miracles he's done for you. So do you, please calculate this. God brings ten makas on Egypt, right? And what happens? God now wants to get rid of, the, we can't and get rid of it all? Does that make sense? No. It doesn't make sense. I can understand when, you know, if God didn't, the Jews escaped Egypt on their own. So they don't see God's hand. Okay, I can understand that. You know what I mean? But after everything that God showed you, you know what I mean? So you don't trust God at all, even though He's demonstrated to you His existence and His intention. What are you guys, idiots? You know what I mean? Because those markers indicated two things, that God exists and His intention. His intention is He loves you and wants to bring you to Eretz Yisrael or give you the Torah. You saw His intention. So how could you suddenly turn around? So you know who took advantage of this? At Yamsut, there's a medrash that says, who took advantage of this? Of the situation? Yeah. The medrash? Took advantage of what? The anger that Hashem was displaying? Yes. Ooh, I don't know. I have no idea. The angel of the Egyptians. Every nation has a malach yeah. which defends them. So the malach of the Mitzrayim went to God and said, He's right. Sutton is right. So make up your mind. If you want to destroy the Egyptians, because if they have a desire, then you have to destroy the Jews. Jews yeah, yeah. And if you want to save the Jews, the reverse, you have to save the Egyptians. There's no things you, that you cannot differentiate anymore between the Jews and the Egyptians. You see what I'm saying? So he said, I'm not telling you to save them, but at the same time, if you, if you don't want to save them, how can you save the Jews? So that was a real taina. And you know what God was doing when he heard this taina? He got up from the kisei of Machemim and he was going to the kisei of Din. And it was, the argument was sufficient that God would decide to destroy them all. So the ones who were supposed to die by Yamsuf are the Egyptians and the Jews. Everybody. Whoa. Imagine that as a play, as a movie. How do you get out of that? You gotta have something good in your pocket to flip out. How do you suddenly change God's mind? Because this is absolute logic. God, it's not irrational. But then you see, it says they saw the bones of Yosef, Asmos Yosef, and then the Yamsuf open, meaning that they saw something that was so, an act that was so defied rationale that Yosef passed that test and that zuchut. What? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not repeating it then. <laughs> I never heard of this What? You never heard of... Uh, um, the Jews didn't have chavot on what? The fact that they felt they wanted to go back to Egypt. No, no, no. I'm saying... Uh, Why did God save the Jews and destroy the Egyptians with that argument confronting them, confronting God. Because God agreed with the argument. He was about to destroy the Jews. How did they, what saved them? I thought, I've heard there was a midrash from Atmos Yosef. And? He saw the bones of Yosef and it reminded him oh, of the crazy test that he passed with Potiphar and that had a zechus to, to save the Jews in that time. So they saw that Yosef was able to... So what did they do? They had chavota on what they did? Because they saw Yosef was saved? 
No, I, I don't know if they had charata. Could have been that they should have still, still been chayiv. But but Hashem had rachamim. It's not it. I didn't think of it. Nice thought. <laughs> Strike one. <laughs> That's a real question. Not only is it a real question, that's what happened. So the real question now is, what saved the Jews? I don't know, but I'm willing to think, uh, you may uh, guess. I mean, we see Nachshon and some other people started jumping in. So they did show a, a level of Bitachon. Yeah, some of them showed. Yeah, Nachshon, we might have uh, jumped into the room. Yeah. But uh, did they recant the desire to go back to Egypt? So you know what the Medu says? One of the defending angels of Israel who defends Israel against Ketugim? Michael. So what did Michael do? He told Gavriel, go down to Egypt and bring up a Jewish baby who was put into the bricks. So he did that. Yeah. He went, and then he came back up. And Bechol took the baby and to the God and said, I agree with the Malach of Egypt. The Jews are equal to the Egyptians. Not necessarily in time. You know, they didn't do the Avodah long, but they, fundamentally he's got an argument. But wait a minute. The question now, so what do I say? I say be merciful on the Jews and be merciful on the Egyptians. Yes. But, wait a minute. You can only be merciful to someone who exhibits mercy, but not cruelty. So this is the height of cruelty. That not only did the Egyptians enslave the Jews, but they killed them also. They used to put babies, I don't know what else. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, they used to bathe in children's blood, the baby's blood. Power. He's a baby in the blood. In the baby's blood, yeah. They would kill, I, I think there's a measure they would kill X amount a day at the babies, and then he would bathe in their blood. Why? For his skin or something. He had some skin thing. Yes. Well, it's cruel to Whatever he did, it was cruel. So therefore we see, and the, the Jews never did these things. So therefore, I say that you should save everyone. Your marachim, be merciful. But... You can only apply mercy to someone who was not cruel. Midik neged mida. So therefore you can apply mercy to the Jews and save them, but not to the Egyptians. So God said, you're right. So he got back, he got up <laughs> and went back <laughs> to the mercy but when it came to the Egyptians, it was then. So we see an amazing principle. That who can earn Olam Haba? If a person doesn't do any mitzvahs, really, right? Persons of what? Bein Adam Lamokam. He says, Machal Shabbos and Machal Adam. I mean, he does everything the wrong way. But, he is not cruel. 
that person can have mercy. But should he exhibit cruelty in his behavior? That's the only person the Mashiach bin Dun can see. Yeah. Say. So, I, it's right, very good. So who can the Mashiach bin Dun save? Just about anybody. Well, it's not cruel. It's not cruel. But now, what does it mean cool? Does it mean cool once in his life or cool most of the time in his life? I would say most of the time. Right. Which means he is designated a cool person. That person will not go to the Mabo. Soros. Yeah. yeah. Like Soros. Or Schiff. You know, the amazing thing, I mean, while watching this, yeah. that the Democrats, first of all, refused to uh, condemn Schiff, even though they were condemning him for, for the right reason. The guy was lied continuously to the American people, created stories and so on, and destroyed the, ruined the presidency of Trump. So what the, not one Democrat voted against Schiff because they wanted a censorship and every Democrat in the Senate and so on. They have actors. Yeah, <laughs> evil has actors <laughs> and that's why they have such power. It's only good people who have no actors. <laughs> you know what I mean? And now that they stood up and when, when they passed, started screaming. they started saying shame. I saw the video of yeah, that. They said, shame, shame. The Democrats were saying to Republicans, shame on you because you want to send your Schiff. What? This guy's an animal. I mean, I've never heard of this. All the Democrats, to a single guy, refused to recognize the evil of Schiff. So we know where they're all going. And the worst among them are Jews. You see what I'm saying? So I think that even Sheikh Bandan cannot save these guys. Or even Schiff. Or Nadler. Yes. Yeah. And we see this from the Egyptians. Okay, but I haven't answered the question. Why is it that the people who do sins are way more, what is the ratio? Nine to one. Easy. Nine to nine people will be, will do sins and only one person will be a tzaddik. Why is Avram Avinu one of the few tzaddikim of the generation, what is it about the Yetzirah which commands such a majority? Mm. And I've had this question for many years. Meaning because then it's not balanced. Yeah. And then there's no free will. Right. So what are you, what are you doing? That means the Tikkun and Nam Sufa it's not subject to free will. It's not fair. Good question. So I have an answer. Wanna try? <laughs> It's all right. Yeah, this one, I'm gonna... Yeah, this is... A I'm gonna throw the I don't know card. The I don't know card. Well, I don't see the card. <laughs> <laughs> the truth of the matter is, you have to understand what's going on. You have to understand what the Nisoyen of Nam Sufi is. The reason why most people fail in the Tikkun Sufa 
is because of the uniqueness of the Tikkun of the Amdik Sufa. How was the uniqueness? There must have been something about this mitzvah, which is, it makes it so hard to overcome. So it has nothing to do with the balance of the Yetzirah and the Yetzirah Tov. It's true, it's equally balanced, but there must be something about this sin which makes it that even though it's balanced, but the sin is so fantastic that makes it very difficult to keep. Not only this, you have to remember something very important. There must be something about the sin of Nandak Sufa that makes it very hard to keep. Why? Because literally, the Ramchal says something that it would have been very easy for other Mauritian to keep the mitzvah. Why did he sin? You felt uh, disempowered. But you have, to, you have to understand something which is very difficult to understand, to realize, you know, and it's for the same reason. It's so unique. God expects us to believe that He exists. Why? Like all scientists in astronomy, they try to understand what created the universe, Big Bang and so on. But Fundamentally, none of them really recognize the existence of God. So the question is, how do you do that? How do you accomplish that? Why? Because when you see the universe, even the planet Earth itself, and you see it, there's something about the universe that indicates the existence of God. Vadai. What's that? Intelligent design. Right. So the question is not of the Yetzirah Tov. It would seem to be unfair. How does the Yetzirah get you to say there is no God? Ah, the question is on his side against free will. Because it's so obvious to any... Why is it? Because it's so obvious. You wake up, you look around. I mean, I, I mean, how can anyone say no? You look at the levels of design in the world. You know what I mean? You know, how, yeah, and, and you, you see that how could the world be random? You look at pregnancy, that inside of a woman's body, she's reconstructing another human being. How the hell is she doing that? <laughs> doesn't, that doesn't that require immense design? You're literally creating every organ slowly, one by one. Yeah. All this, I mean, come on. You know, that's like being at a roulette table. You know, and that 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 every time you turn the roulette wheel, it goes to the number seven. <laughs> then what do you say? Let's say the number seven out of the wheel goes to the number seven, nine out of ten times. What would you say about that roulette wheel? It's rigged. <laughs> it's rigged. You know what I mean? Simply the frequency of it tells you that it's rigged. You know what I mean? <laughs> so therefore, how does the Sutton get over that? How could the Sutton convince everyone, it's scientists, all scientists, that God doesn't exist? That it's all random? I mean, are you kidding? Well, you must have a balanced power if it's that obvious that God created the world, he's going to have a power that's equally as powerful. And what is that? That is Nama Dichi Sufa. What is Nama Sufa? It's the, well, it's really, his power would be... 
What is so powerful about Naman Sufa that almost everyone who touches this problem sins? That's what we have to answer. That's why so many people, almost all the whole human race, are sinners. But the question is, I've just told you something which would push the power of the Yetzir Toiv on the real, on the dominant side. In other words, who's more powerful? Which Yates is more powerful? As as of right this minute in our analysis, yeah. the Yates are Tov. Yeah, but that doesn't make sense. What is his power? You see, what I've done is, we always see by the amount of people who sin, the number of people who sin, that obviously the Yates are Tov, the Yates are horror, has much more power. Yeah. And we don't understand why. But now what I've just thrown in, is a new piece of work. I've not only shown you that not only the Yetzir Horus is, 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 should not be so powerful, but that the Yetzir Torah should be powerful. I've converted the whole problem on the other side. So that means what is going on with Nam Sufa that inverts the whole situation? In other words, in either case, we're dealing with some kind of dominance. Either the Eitz Ahura is totally dominant, when we look at all the people that do it, or the Eitz Ahura is dominant, when we see the plant concept of design. But what we see, there's an inequality either way. So how is the Eitz Ahura able to convince mankind against the Eitz Tov. To say that God does not exist and did not create the world sounds like an action of psychosis. <laughs> you have to be psychotic to deny God's existence. Unfortunately, there's many people in this world that are How? psychotic. But we don't understand this. How? And that means the Eitz Ahura does a, a fantastic job with the least amount of credibility. How does something which is so un, un, uncredible become so dominant? You know what I mean? The one who should win the battle is the Eitz Ahura. And that's what the Ramchal means. That when it came to Adam Rishon, it was really simple. When he looked at his own existence, and he looked at God Eden. Design. Well, God was talking to him too, so it's like. Well, and I know yeah. God was. Well, in, in, in that sense, yeah. The problem really wasn't his disbelief in God. Yeah. At that point, he, there was no yet so not to believe in God. But that's why it was fairly simple. How did it become so complex? So something does not make sense. In essence, why did Adam uh, Adam sin then? If the Ram Kaza was, it would have been easy for him not to. I've heard somewhere that he wanted, uh, he knew that if he created the test, there could have been more scars. So he ate. On yeah, purpose. I know. The, 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 I think there was some. I know this. That his motive was was really good. Yeah, I, I, I don't. Yeah. I don't buy that. But somebody has to defend the Yitzhah. How does he do what he does? What is the test of Nautic Sufa? What makes a person think? What, what does the Yetzirah do to you? What, what's he doing for this? I mean, what's his source of his power? How? Because we see that the source of the Yetzirah 
is tremendous. So what kind of opposite source of his, what's the source of his power? What is the biggest desire of a person in the end? Power. Power, self-esteem, exaggerated into power. And how does the eighth, how does the eight zero tell the person to do? Well, hate your fellow man. It's because you know that the source of it is has a lot to do with men being against another person, mm -hmm. lord over him, dominate him, kill well, that him. That was the that was the second mask we talked about of Zoma. Well, I mean, you saw everybody as an outside yourself, so the idea of multiplicity became a reality in a sense. Yeah. Well, if you were in, induced in terms of power, you suddenly gave into it. Why? Because the problem with you, what you're doing is you're trying to say that the main thing that the Yetzor gave you is power. What did the Yetzor really do to you by making you powerful? What do you mean by making Powerful. By by giving you power, by you taking power in any which way, why did you suddenly say, yes, I want it? So there's something about power, which is, you know, it wasn't simply pleasure. You could say the Yetzirah gave you pleasure, you know. So that induced a person to be motivated to sin. Not really. So if it wasn't pleasure, what was it? Does that ever occur, where it's just based on pleasure? I mean. No, I mean, I mean pleasure, but pleasure cannot convince you from the other side there's no God. It's strong. A person who's a hedonist and wants pleasure of the eight zone, that, that, that's true. You're just focusing on the issue of disbelief in God. Yeah. Isolating that issue. Right. How does power convince a person to deny God's existence? Pleasure alone can... I don't believe pleasure can do it. I mean, when you feel pleasure, you feel it for a couple of minutes. Yeah, but by default, we feel independent of God. I Meaning, I'm only aware of myself. A person's only aware of their own being. Because what does the Pusik say? It's contained in the Pusik. <laughs> Somehow that person tells you what the Yetzirah is offering you. What is he offering you? Kochi. Koch. Koch to what? To oser, to do, to create, to make. So what is he saying you are? You're God. Right. That's it. This is not some Yetzo where you, you know, you, you have a pleasure, you know, the steak tastes great, the lamb chop is good. Is the lamb chop <laughs> worth saying, well, I love this lamb chop, I don't believe in God. <laughs> no, you say the opposite, I love this lamb chop, but thank you God, you know. I mean, come on, it could be an inducement, I, I love this tray food, so therefore there's no God, that, 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 does that sound normal? No. No. What is he really saying to you? What did the Pesach say? Kurchi vi oitzim yodi osso es kola chayel hazer. In other words, you are God. That's what it's saying. And that power that suddenly you are God, it doesn't mean that you are equal to God or as great as God, but that's the concept. If God controls the entire width of this length of this table. But you say, I also can do. So what you're really saying is, the last square inch, the last inch on this table, does not belong to God, it belongs to me. What is the significance of that? What have you done when you say that? He has the whole table. I admit God created the universe and everything in it. Wow. So what is it by saying, because he allowed that I did the last thing. 
So suddenly because you did that last thing, you can rebel against God? I mean, well, well, this doesn't make sense. What do you gain by taking the last thing in your, uh, in your possession? You gain a feeling of power. You gain a feeling okay, of feeling of power. power. No, it, it makes you... No, it gives you the power of God. Why? And what does it do to the power of God? What does it do to God when you say, you have built this entire thing except the last inch? I mean, it diminishes his power or his... Right, his it, it takes his God. He is no longer divine. Because he... Why? Because... He no longer has centrality. Right. Because there's something outside of him. Right. So therefore, I'm not as great as God, but I am still a God. Yeah. And God is... Is therefore God and I exist together. And God and there was so God is not God, because the definition of God is someone who does everything. Enoid, enoid, mavadoi. You know, that's why the, you've created a second God. Of the Vada, yeah. Where he's God and I'm also God. True, I'm not as God quantitatively like him, but qualitatively. I can exist outside of him. And that alone is God. Because it puts a certain portion of centrality in your power. That feeling of being God also is so satisfying. It's such a gift that you will give up all the design that he makes. Yeah, God designed. He's all over the place with design. But he is not God, because he is not absolute. You've made him God relative. Relative to me, he's God. But he's not absolute, because I'm also God. Even though I'm a smaller God, and he's a larger God, he's ne neither of us are really total absolute gods. And so therefore you believe in the duality of existence, I and myself, you believe that fundamentally exists is dual, you and me. That reinforces the me and you. Even though the ratio of that, me and you, is very big, God is like a hundred to one. Okay, but I'm one. I'm one and I'm outside of God, where he does not control me. And there's such a simcha in that possibility that I'll concede to God 99%. But just to take 1% of independence is such a centrality that I'm willing to say, okay, God made everything, but not everything. I also made something. And the pleasure of that is so absolute that suddenly the Eighth says, wait a minute, I can also give you something. And it's not a small thing. I'm not just giving you a pleasure. You know, that lamb chop must be great. Maybe, okay, I grant you that. But you're not going to give up the totality of God because of a lamb chop. No. But you will give it up if at the same time you become God because that you are. Because what God, the essence of God is independence. You don't need anyone. There's nothing outside of you. In this thing that I create, I'm outside of God. I did it. Which means, what does it mean I did it? I did it and God did not do it. I didn't need him. And that suddenly gives you the power of being God. Mm. And that is so um, awesome that you'll throw it all away. So it's not simply Namak Sufa. It's that Namak Sufa creates me, you, where both the me and the you are gods. I'm a little god and he's a big god. But you're God too. Because you have absolute control 
on one inch. And that is so exhilarating. Everyone falls for it. That's why most of humanity continues to sins. They don't want to give up that pleasure. Pleasure of what? Not the pleasure of having power. The pleasure of having absolute power. Of having some corner of the universe is mine and does not belong to God. So there's a, a stark difference between somebody who's sinning and says in his mind, there's no God, I can do whatever I want, versus somebody who is aware but can't control himself. He's feeling, you know. The feeling of power that you can do something you want, even though it's small, but you do it, not God, is so absolute, it's so enthralling that everybody falls. So therefore, the eights are wins because he has a message. He's not simply telling you to do because of a pleasure. He's telling you, my gift to you is I will make you God. That's what he told Adam. That's what he told Adam. I believe that's the answer. That's the source of his power. That he's not giving you a pleasure. He's giving you something which is infinite. Something which belongs to the divine world. And he's making you believe that you're partly divine. And that's why m most of mankind keeps on falling. So how does that sound? So, and that's the balance. And that balances it. But that doesn't answer our question. Why are there... Because the Yitzhah is so small. No, but then, so then it's more powerful than Yitzhah Tov. Yeah. That's why God has to be merciful. Ah, that's the, that's the, the outcome. Yeah. Because it's really not balanced. So then, so then what happens to free will? Free will does not exist in such a free way. In a certain way, it doesn't. But you see, it is balanced because you see God as being a, the real creator of everything. I mean, God is not just a little bit better than you. Yeah. You know? And you, make a, you, you build a building nice. And God builds what? The, the, world. World. the universe. <laughs> the universe. So how can you compare that? Because we're talking about God. We're talking about the feeling that you get when you believe that you are. You control something. You have a certain level of absolute power. And that is so enthralling that it can weigh against the fact that he constructed the universe and you have a little car. So the issue of Nama Dechi Sufa is more prevalent amongst people who believe in God. It's just that they want to feel also, that, experience that the same. Sense, they experience the sense of self as God. As God. Right. Because most people, I think, agree there is a God. But yeah. they think they can also be one too. Right. And that also is so enticing I mean, that's what you see you know, in the whole non-Jewish world, the idea of superheroes. Right. In Greek mythology. Yeah. Man can be God also. Yeah. That's what they continue to see in all the religions. Make man into a God. Yeah. I mean, so sometimes I used to think about it. Like, why did they believe Jesus is God? I mean, it was just a... Because it's enticing. It's not that they made Jesus God because they needed to make Jesus God. They need to believe that man can be God. And you know what that's called? A man who is God? Avatar. Avatar? Uh. Yeah, that's what avatar means. Like uh, Krishna. Krishna was a person, but he's considered the divine being. 
Well, how do you do that? Because you can be human and be God at the same time. And that's the essence of the Yetzirah. Only with respect to that sin. So these are the two sides of the equation. How do you... I, I, I'm sorry, sorry. These are two sides of the equation. One side of the equation that fortifies the Yetzirah that he makes you into a God. Because you are outside of God. You don't need God for everything. There's certain things you can do and be responsible for yourself. And that power exacerbates your centrality as against the power of the Eitz Tov. What's the power of the Eitz Tov? Incredible design on a universal scale. So, Zelu Mazer. Yeah. You are God versus unbelievable design. You see the battle? The battle is not, what do you call it, pleasure versus absolute, absolute design. That's not the battle. It's that you are God. That's why all the Greeks, the Greeks believed in their gods, and all their gods were human. Zeus and Apollo, I mean, uh, you know I mean? Poseidon. Poseidon. These were men. I mean, when I see this, it's comical. But what really ticks me off is the concept of the, the mother of God. Oh, yeah. I mean, I... <laughs> we'll marry in the whole... Yeah, the mother of God. <laughs> mother of God. Do you know what you're talking about yeah. when you say God's mother? I mean, that, that is so absurd. Not only are you saying that God has a cause, but God has the same cause as I do. <laughs> My mother. <laughs> In other words, the answer doesn't dignify that statement, you know? The statement that 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 I don't have a that God is not a doesn't have a mother is so obvious. And the incredible thing is that God tolerates this. It's crazy. I mean, that's insane. When, see, if you really think about it, that's insane. <clears throat> that God tolerates this. What? You're comparing me to this guy on the toilet? Is that what you're doing? That's what you're doing. I mean, that, that's such an insult. And how he tolerates that is unbelievable. Like why he allows the Zulasa to get away with that. You know what I mean? But don't think that God does not respect Christians. Because you have to understand that God sees Christianity because you have to understand what a religion is. A religion is fundamentally a position. God says, okay, you've gotten to get rid of me and you replace me with a human being. I accept that avoider as long as I'm included in that spirituality. So since you say God the Father and I'm also there, okay, I will respect. So in other words, God's saying, you can either worship me as a mature being or as a teenager or as a child. That's what it is. Christianity is, is God is, a, is, is childish. Because I asked myself the question, how, how could man believe that God is a, is a human being? So you know what my answer was? The big deal. No, but not that. No. Because child believes their parents are God. Right. So that's the big deal. Oh, the, that's the what child, you meant. Okay. Childhood. Because there is a phase in life where you, where the, where you actually believe that the other person is God. Why does a child believe that his parent is God? Because he's completely dependent on them. He gets all his self-esteem, his self worth. Self In other words, he derives his existence from, from, God, from the parent. So the parent must be God. If I need you to tell me that I'm somebody, and I can't get out of that. I cannot get out of that. So therefore, 
Christianity is nothing more than a continuation of childhood in adult life. Because this is not an alien concept in the human experience. You know what I mean? At a certain point, the human being has that belief. My parent is God. Because he's the one that determines if I'm happy or not. When he says to me, I love you, I'm happy. And he says to me, that's no good what you're doing. I hate you. He's a God. I take that statement as if it was said by God himself. That's childhood. You understand what I'm saying? So therefore, Christianity is nothing more than a child's belief in what God is at the child level. So therefore, religions are either an adult religion, a teenage religion, or a childishness. They're based on some belief at that age. That's what the premius is. So God respects this. He respects Christianity and he says, I accept this Avoida as long as you include me in the Avoida. I don't mind sharing my bed with someone else. It's the Muddik Rachmanis God has. <coughs> you see, what you see about God is God has one thing. He has total confidence. He doesn't take it personal. I mean, he has no cause. So how can he take anything personal? So that's why he's willing to live with that. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's the truth. I realize that. Sometimes I go into it, you know.